Good evening, everybody, or I should say good morning uh, to some of our participants uh, in the other parts of the world. So uh, this is our second, uh, I mean, uh, uh, global uh, scientific seminar uh, from the Asian Pediatric Hematology Oncology Group. So um, uh, we are very honored to have a very distinguished speaker today. Um, and today, we have two moderators. The first moderator uh, is Professor Ching Nao. Professor Ching Nao actually um, uh, finished his PhD and MD degree at the Harvard University. And then with, uh, he has his postdoc training in Dana Farber Institute uh, before he moved to uh, Baylor uh, University um, uh, for pediatric both training and also uh, uh, research. And finally, uh, he moved to uh, Jackson Laboratory and University of Connecticut and become professor there. Uh, so he's very experienced in uh, uh, both uh, scientific research, basic science research, and also uh, clinical work. So he will be both a speaker and moderator uh, tonight. And then the other moderator uh, is uh, another very well-known um, uh, Asian scholar, uh, Professor Alice Yu. Professor Alice Yu graduated from National Taiwan University, and then he got his uh, master's degree in Yale and uh, PhD uh, degree. Uh, uh, suddenly, it left my mind. <laughs> uh, University uh, of Chicago. At <laughs> University of Chicago, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I'm aging, uh, and then uh, and then he went to uh, uh, he spent uh, another twenty something years, right, uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, University of uh, uh, California San Diego, and then became a professor and also the uh, uh, department head of the uh, pediatric uh, hematology oncology. So uh, then he returned. Uh, to Taiwan and worked uh, in the uh, academic uh, Seneca. Uh, so um, he's also very well known uh, for his achievement uh, in the immunotherapy for liverpastoma, especially uh, the NDGD2. So actually he also uh, gave a lecture uh, uh, several months ago and, and uh, on the repurposing of drugs uh, on um, the um, hot... Uh, <coughs> um, T cell. T cell lymphoma. Yeah, so I, I can still remember. Mm -hmm. So um, both of them, uh, Alice and Chen, will introduce our speaker. And tonight, uh, uh, the theme uh, is on advances in brain tumor. And actually, the brain tumor has many different types. And uh, the one of the emphasis that uh, we try to talk tonight is germ cell tumor, which is very prevalent. Uh, in Asia. So uh, um, so without further ado, uh, Cheng and Alice, you will uh, take the platform and introduce our speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Godfrey. Uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who is also my colleague here, uh, Dr. Joanna Gao. Uh, she's an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. <clears throat> and also an attending physician at the Connecticut Children's Medical Center uh, uh, in the uh, cancer, uh, Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders. In addition, uh, she's also uh, a research scientist at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine here in uh, Connecticut. Uh, she completed her pediatric residency uh, at the University of South Carolina and uh, her uh, pediatric hematology oncology fellowship at the uh, University of California, uh, Los Angeles, UCLA, uh, where she developed an interest in uh, germ cell tumors. While she was uh, in the fellowship program, she was mentored by uh, Amanda Clark. Uh, some of you might know, she's a world expert in stem cell and germ cell biology. And there she uh, learned to apply this knowledge to study the uh, origins of germ cell tumors. So her research now is focusing primarily on uh, developing novel uh, in vitro models to study germ cell tumors, as well as biology. 
and also develop new uh, biomarkers and therapeutics for uh, germ cell tumors. So we're glad to have you here, Joanna. Thank you. Thanks for that lovely introduction. All right, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, so as uh, Ching mentioned, um, I'm Joanna Gal, and I have an interest in um, studying the biology of germ cell tumors, and I sort of span the field in that I have an interest in both intra and extracranial germ cell tumors. Um, and really focus a lot on the early biology that leads to germ cell tumors. So today I'm going to discuss some of the shared biology of intra and extracranial germ cell tumors and sort of how can we meld these two fields together a little bit to help advance some of the diagnostic and treatment options that we have for these patients. So I have no conflicts of interest. And the objectives of this talk is first, we're just going to start to talk about the just developmental biology behind germ cell tumors, talking about key developmental aspects of normal germ cell development, and understand how alterations in some of these key aspects could potentially lead to tumor genesis. And then we'll discuss the current hypothesis of how the cell of origin for germ cell tumors, the primordial germ cell, transforms um, into a germ cell tumor and how these sort of can be used to understand tumor genesis as well as use them um, to understand how we could treat or diagnose these better. And throughout this talk, I'll sh be sharing how these different aspects um, are shared or differ between intra and extracranial germ cell tumor. So just briefly, you know, as some of you might know a little bit about germ cell tumors, um, from a histologic sort of standpoint, they're a very heterogeneous type of tumor. Um, they occur in multiple sites of the body, primarily along the midline as if they are not in the gonads. So that includes sacrococcygeal, mediastinal, and as many of you know, intracranially. Additionally, they're unique in that they have multiple histology subtypes, and this is um, representative of the spectrum of tissue differentiation that we see in them. So broadly, as we talk, um, myself and others today, we'll be discussing that you have the germinal state, ones that look like germ cells. So this includes seminomas in the testes, dysgerminoma in the ovary, or any extra gonadal, inter including intracranially germinomas. And then you have your non-germinomatous subtypes. And within that, you have both malignant and benign types of tumor. So the malignant forms of the non-germinomatous type are the embryonic carcinoma that looks like the inner cell mass or early embryonic tissue, yolk sac tumor, which has some resemblance to the yolk sac and choriocarcinoma. Um, and then also you have teratomas that can be divided into mature and immature, depending on how much neural um, elements are in there. Additionally, um, you know, we can see some differences in the biology or the representation of histology by age. So broadly, when discussing primarily um, sort of extracranial germ cell tumors, they're divided up into type one and type two type germ cell tumors. And when we're talking about type one tumors, this is predominantly what we see in very young age. So from birth to about two to three years of age is predominated by this type two. These are prepubital patients that primarily have teratomas, and if it's malignant, it's almost exclusively yolk sac tumors. And at this age, there's a bit of a female predominance as compared to when you look at type two tumors, which are around post-pubertal or as you hit puberty, um, they are predominantly males that get these and they're represented by all of the different histology types. So now let's talk about the cell of origin for the germ cell tumors. So the cell of origin that's um, most likely thought to be is the primordial germ cell. And the primordial germ cell is the earliest form of the mammalian germ cell that is present during in utero. And PGCs harbor very unique properties that would allow them to potentially transform into a germ cell tumor that represents all of these histology types that we see. And there's a number of unique properties of primordial germ cell development um, that need to occur in order to have a fully functioning germ cell, which ultimately becomes a mature sperm or egg. So the first step that happens is specification. This means that during development, there's a subset of cells that are set aside to say that they are only going to become germ cells. Um, following this, you have migration and proliferation and epigenetic reprogramming that happen all around the same time. 
once the primordial germ cell hit the gonads, they then go undergo sex determination and then eventually full differentiation. And as one can imagine, an alteration in any one of these steps could lead to a disease state such as infertility or um, germ cell tumor development. So as we've learned more about the um, germ cell development in mammals and especially in humans, we've noted that there's different stages of development of the primordial germ cell. So um, as I mentioned, primordial germ cells are an embryonic state. Um, so, and they actually occur very early on in development. So they start to be specified around weeks two to three post, post fertilization in the human. And around this time you get specification followed by the, by, the, um, by the migration along the midline. And this is what we call an early PGC. And these early PGCs can be defined by a number of transcription factors, pluripotency factors, and epigenetic marks that are present in these cells. As they migrate, as I mentioned, they start to proliferate and they start to lose some of their methylation or grow under epigenetic reprogramming, as you can see by this graph that shows the loss of 5-MC, which is um, an epigenetic methylation mark. And there should be certain um, temporal genes that turn off or on as we go around this developmental time point so that we can call germ cells early PGC, late PGC, and an advanced PGC that ultimately then differentiates into a fully formed PGC. So one of, part of my work was, although most people felt like primordial germ cells probably were the cell of origin, there is always at times, especially when we're talking about extra gonadal, is are these really coming from germ cells? And if so, what's sort of the temporal time point that they could be coming from that would make sense for a germ cell to be in the brain as we see with intracranial germ cell tumors? So one thing I did was look at CNS um, germinomas and looked at some of these important markers that we would say that would define a PGC at a certain stage and see what are some of the markers that we have. So what I did was I took PLOP, which is a very common marker of germ cells, which you can see here is positive in green. I also looked at CKIT and OCT4, which are always very established uh, markers of germ cells and germ cell tumors. And you can see that in a CNS germinoma, you do in fact have OCT4, CKIT, and PLOP. So that keeps us saying that yet, yes, this is a germ cell and that it is either an early or a late PGC. So then I look to see, do we see any of the late PGC markers by this um, uh, gene called VASA? And you can see that we do in fact have VASA positive in the CNS germinomas, but then I wanted to say exactly which stage they are, which is mostly marked by your epigenetic modifications. So in, um, Late to advanced PGC, there's a difference in the um, chromatin or histone marker H3K27, where it should turn off as you turn into an advanced PGC. But as you can see down in this bottom platform, we still have H3K27 within our germinomas. Um, but we have started to go under 5-MC loss where you can see where there's the OCT4 red, there isn't any 5-MC. So that stages um, these germinomas um, in the brain to be a late stage PGC, which would be equivalent to a late um, migratory PGC right before it hits the gonads, which would make sense about the hypothesis of extracranial germ cell tumors that it was a malmigrated uh, PGC that is the potential cell of origin for these. But we'll note that there is one transcription factor that's important for germ cell development and for stem cell um, maintenance, um, PRDM14, that should be turning off as you develop into a late to advanced PGC. And around the time that I was starting my research, um, there was some interest in PRDM14 in germ cell tumors. So now I'm just gonna take a step back and talk about the two models of what have been hypothesized for germ cell tumor developments. And one model has been the reprogramming model where people have hypothesis that a fully committed germ cell reacquires pluripotency and de-differentiates towards this more stem cell-like cell that then is allowed to transform into a germ cell tumor. The other hypothesis, and the one that's probably more widely accepted now based off of a number of events that I'll discuss in the talk is the failure to determine model. And the failure to determine model says that a, that a developing PGC fails to fully commit to the germline and sort of go past that 
sort of advanced committed to only becoming a germ cell and that it remains in this sort of plastic state that can allow for differentiation into all of the other phenotypes that we see or histology types that we see in germ cell tumors. And so um, in a number of events such as altered kit ligand signaling, um, acquired or um, inherited um, alterations in some anti-apoptotic um, sex determination and whatnot genes are the ones that allow for this to occur. So the reason why the failure to determination mo uh, model has been the one that's been relatively wild, uh, more widely accepted is that one, um, GCTs may maintain this expression of PGC markers and pluripotency factor factors and the retention of these pluripotency factors are what allows. So this is just a heat map um, from Taki Takami et al. from a journal in 2022 that was looking at mostly intracranial, but also um, uh, compared this to some testicular germ cell tumors and some cell lines, as well as normal germ cells. And you can see that there are a number of uh, pluripotency markers that are retained within mostly these blue germinomas, as well as these germ cell tumors across the top as well as you can see that there are a number of early and late PGC genes that are retained within these um, germ cell tumors, both when you're talking about germinomas and mixed germ cell tumors, with it being slightly more um, striking in the germinomas. So this brings me back to um, PRDM14 and one of the pluripotency markers, as well as germ cell markers that should be turning off as you would go from late to advanced um, and um, both testicular and intracranial germ cell tumors have identified alterations um, in PRDM14 as a potential um, susceptibility loci um, for um, germ cell tumors, as well as it's amplified in a number of germ cell tumors, both intracranially and extracranially. So um, the normal function of PRDM14 is that it's um, helps with maintaining um, germ cell um, uh, specific genes right after specification. It helps with maintaining pluripotency and it helps with epigenetic reprogramming, specifically chromatin modification. Um, and this is done in the mouse and the humans by a cofactor called CBFAT2 that is important to maintain this sort of germ lineage development. Um, and there was a time point um, where two groups found that if you knock out PRDM14 or CBFAT2, you then lose your germ cells and your pluripotency. And therefore, um, you know, this has been an area that I've looked into seeing what's the role in germ cell tumors and can this be used as almost a therapeutic mark to say if we disrupt the interaction between these two genes, can you disrupt the growth or proliferation of germ cell tumors? So this is a project that we've been working on um, to develop um, a, a drug that could disrupt this interaction um, by doing in silico drug screening to identify compounds that can work on disrupting this interaction. Um, and so there is work that's being done. So first I started by just validating that in fact, PRDM14 is expressed in malignant germ cell tumors. And by doing some in vitro work, um, looking at if you inhibit PRDM14 or disrupt this, that we do get some cell death within germ cell tumors. So this is a project that's ongoing, showing that this, plur this germ cell marker that should be repressed as you differentiate is still present in germ cell tumors. And so some of these sort of pluripotency or germ lineage markers that should be turned off in normal development that aren't present in normal somatic cells are potential targets um, for treating germ cell tumors. So next, um, I'll discuss some other sort of uh, normal developmental uh, markers that also have been implemented in germ cell tumor genesis, as, as well as identified as potential biomarkers that we can use for germ cell tumors. So um, microRNAs um, are um, small, non-coding RNAs that are important in normal development and in disease. And really their role is to alter expressions of the messenger RNA. 
And um, uh, recently, there's been a lot of interest in uh, microRNAs and tumor genesis across broad types of cancers um, because there are at normal development tissue specific types of microRNAs. And if they are either um, overexpressed or turned off and on in an altered way, they could play a role in uh, tumor genesis. So when discussing germ cell tumors, there are two clusters of microRNAs that are normally present in embryonic stem cells and primordial germ cells during normal development, but are turned off as they differentiate into mature somatic or more mature germ cells. And these two clusters are microRNAs 371 to 373 and the microRNA cluster 302, 367. And actually for about a decade, it's been known in extracranial germ cell tumors that these two clusters uh, can be present in both the adults and the pediatric type of malignant germ cell tumors, but is not found in normal tissue or in the benign teratomas. So you can see in these two heat maps, uh, on the right-hand side, the blue, yellow, and red are the malignant um, germinomas, yolk sac tumors, and embryonal carcinomas, and there's high expression of these two clusters in both adult and pediatric tumors. But if you look at these green and uh, maroon-colored teratoma and normal gonadal controls, they're very low expressed in them. Additionally, um, more folks have I've investigated which one of these markers is potentially the most um, uh, uh, advantageous as a new biomarker for identification of testicular germ cell tumors. And the one within the 371 to 373 cluster, microRNA 370A3P, has at least within testicular germ cell tumors, has been found to be quite sensitive and specific specific to testicular germ cell tumors. So as you know, the current tumor markers that are used for germ cell tumor, beta ECG and AFP, um, are only a present in a number of um, germ cell tumors as not all histologies secrete AFP or HCG, as well as these aren't super specific to just germ cell tumors. You can find them in other entities. And so this group by Dykeman et al., they looked at what is the sensitivity, specificity, and the positive predictive value in um, testicular germ cell tumors for this microRNA 371A3P. And they found that it, when looking at either AFP or HCG and LDH alone or combined that um, microRNA 371A3P outperformed all of these markers with a sensitivity of 90%, a specificity of 94, and a positive predictive value of having a positive malignant germ cell tumor of 97.2. Um, and so how does this pertain to intracranial germ cell tumors? So. Um, across the board with brain tumors, we've been thinking of ways that we can better do diagnosis as well as following response to disease, recurrence of disease along the way. And as many of you know, the um, traditional way of diagnosing and following intracranial type tumors is by doing a number of things such as CSF biopsies, tissue biopsies, and, and as well as imaging characteristics that diagnose these brain tumors. <clears throat> However, um, there are some ways that we could shift our way and almost develop liquid biopsies for intracranial type tumors, specifically for intracranial germ cell tumors, where you could utilize the CSF that we're already collecting for cytology to do other types of liquid biopsies on them. This includes things like metabolomics, microRNA isolation, <laughs> and circulating tumor DNA. And for this talk, we're gonna focus on the microRNA isolation. So um, two groups have, um, published small case series of proof of principle to show that you can potentially identify these microRNAs that have been developed for mar tar markers of testicular germ cell tumor in patients with intracranial germ cell tumors. So Murray et al. and um, Schoenberg et al. Um, did show that you can identify um, these microRNAs in the CSF of malignant germ cell tumors. This was just three patients that they were able to identify the um, different microRNAs in the clusters. But then when you looked at a non-germ cell tumor, brain tumor case, you were able to see that you don't see <clears throat> these microRNAs. Um, and then Schoenberg looked at both serum and CSF and showed that in a number of patients, you can also identify these in the serum, but it's not as, um, but there's some variation between the CSF and serum. 
So our group is working on um, further validating this by, as I mentioned, these are small case series where there's only been about anywhere three to six patients that were um, evaluated. And so we're looking at, looking at a larger number and validating as well as seeing if 371 <laughs> excuse me, pans out to be the most sensitive and specific um, as we see in the testicular, or is it a combination um, that we can use? Additionally, we're trying to figure out, um, are there other markers that we can use to potentially decipher between germinomas and non-germinomas um, and various aspects of how we can utilize what we know from the testicular world and microRNAs and bring it into the intracranial world. Okay. Next, we're gonna sort of shift and talk about what are some of the sort of germline and somatic alterations um, that we see at the gene level that could um, lead to germ cell tumor genesis as, and some of the overlap that we're starting to identify between intracranial and extracranial. <clears throat> so as um, many of you know, there's not many um, recurrent somatic mutations that we see in germ cell tumors. Um, the most common thing we see is some chromosomal aberration, aberrations with seeing increases in copy number alterations with gains or loss of whole chromosomes or portions of chromosomes. Um, and in the extracranial world, specifically in the testicular testicular world, the most common one is um, uh, the addition of a portion of chromosome 12 or isochrome 12. Um, and then the recurrent somatic mutations that we see across intracranial and extracranial germ cell tumors are alterations in the K RAS and MAPK or AKT mTOR pathways. Um, however, um, there is a high incidence of uh, having uh, familial testicular germ cell tumors or, 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 or enrichment, as we mentioned, in intracranial germ cell tumors in certain populations. Um, and this is thought to be due to not having a high penetrance allele, but multiple low penetrance susceptibility loci that may, that may link um, normal germ cell development alterations that could lead to germ cell tumors. So when we're talking about the heritable risk of germ cell tumors, there are some overlaps that have been found between testicular and intracranial germ cell tumors. So the bulk of the work has been done by doing um, genome-wide association studies on testicular tumors, where uh, as of now, there's 78 identified susceptibility loci that are linked to tumor genesis. Um, some of the more notable ones that have been found, and that I'll discuss in this talk, are BAF1, and recently there was a genome-wide association study that revealed BAC1 is also a susceptibility loci in intracranial germ cell tumors. However, the region within this gene that is altered is different between intracranial and testicular tumors overall, but there is some overlap where you can find the, the, the lesion that we see in intracranial um, alterations in BAC1 also in testicular. Um, and there were a number of other um, SNPs that have been identified in intracranial in extracranial germ cell tumor that have then be identified in intracranial. So there does seem to be at the sort of herit uh, germline risk some overlap between the susceptibility loci that we see in testicular and intracranial germ cell tumors. So part of what's been difficult with these. Uh, GWAS studies is that we need a way of validating that these do work in a functional way that could lead to germ cell tumors. Um, and because the cell of origin is an embryonic origin, it's been difficult to validate these um, susceptibility loci. Um, and so one thing that our group has been working on is doing some functional validation of these susceptibility loci by generating the primordial germ cell like cells in a dish. So over the last decade, there's been um, advancements in using um, pluripotent stem cells to generate primordial germ cells in a dish. Um, the method that we use in our lab is we take an induced pluripotent stem cell, we expose it to active NA and Chiron, which makes this intermediate cell called the incipient mesoderm-like cells. Following that, we expose these cells to uh, LIF, BMP4, and EGF, um, and make these aggregates. And within these aggregates, they contain um, the primordial germ cell-like cells that can be um, sorted out through um, BACs. And with these, we can 
introduce different alterations into the stem cells that would be analogous to the susceptibility loci. And we can do a number of functional tests to see how these susceptibility loci alter normal germ cell development and see if a combination of them and an addition of some of the somatic mutations would then lead to a germ cell tumor in a dish type picture. And currently there's a MD PhD student working with Dr. Lau and I on um, evaluating a number of these susceptibility loci. So next we'll discuss a little bit about some of the somatic alterations across the germ cell tumors. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, one of the largest um, types of somatic alteration that we see in germ cell tumors is copy number alterations. So, um, this is where we see a quite a big overlap between intracranial and extracranial germ cell tumors, where although on this top panel, you, this is the intracranial germ cell tumors and the gain and loss of um, different regions of all the chromosome, and this is the testicular germ cell tumors, um, you can see that there is a number of overlap in the same uh, chromosomes that are gained and lost within intracranial germ cell tumors and testicular germ cell tumors. So, such as gain of chromosome seven and eight, the 12P that I mentioned, as well as loss of four, five, 10, 11, 13, and 18. But as you can notice, this is just highlighting um, the 12P gain that although the regions are very similar between testicular and intracranial germ cell tumor, the frequency of these alterations are higher in, in testicular than they are in intracranial, but in general, the same regions are altered across the two. And then when we're talking about somatic alterations that have to do with signaling pathways in both intracranial and extracranial um, germ cell tumors, KIT and KRAS signaling mutations are the most common ones that we see. Um, and KIT um, accounts for about 20% of the alterations and KRAS for about 10%. The kit mutations are enriched in the seminomatous or germinomatous type, but you can see it across the types. Um, additionally, there are also amplifications within these genes and these pathways that alter um, the, the expression of the signaling within these um, pathways, in addition to some loss of, um, of uh, signaling by uh, negative feedback. So there is um, quite a bit of overlap when we're talking about somatic alterations between these. Um, and so this brings up to, given that KIT and KRAS um, have been no noted to occur quite frequently in some of the intracranial germ cell tumors, how can we use these as potential um, therapeutic targets? And that is an area of interest. So the specific location that KIT is most commonly altered is within exon 17, followed by exon 11. Uh, I mean, uh, followed by exon 11. And this, um, and how can we? Um, use this as a potential targeted therapy. And, and this is an area of research also within our group um, and potentially um, some clinical trials coming down the pipeline using kit mutation, uh, uh, using uh, kit inhibitors or um, to treat uh, germ cell tumors. So next I'm going to shift to um, how we can utilize what we know about um, methylation and epigenetic reprogramming in germ cell tumors. As I mentioned, um, epigenetic reprogramming is an important aspect of normal germ cell development because this allows for all of your sort of uh, true resetting of the genome to allow for a sperm and egg to, to come together and make a different uh, human. Um, and so one thing that we see in um, normal, both mouse and human development is that um, the 5MC loss is a critical aspect of resetting of the genome within germ cell tumors where um, a normal developmental PGC is one of the least methylated um, uh, tish, uh, cells within the body. Um, and it pretty much erases most of the 5MC marks um, besides a few marks. And this is critical for normal germ cell development. 
So when groups have looked at methylation between um, different types of germ cell tumors, you can sort of use the methylation status of your 5MC or, or globally methylated to decipher between the two broad groups of germ cell tumors. So between either seminoma and germinoma, when we're talking about testicular and intracranial germ cell tumors, as well as non-seminoma. And so this, this can be used to identify potentially do you have a seminoma or non-seminoma um, and might help us give us some idea about some of the signaling that goes on um, in germ cell tumors. And this methylation mark has also potentially in testicular germ cell tumors been linked to cisplatin methylation. So cisplatin resistance, um, testicular germ cell tumors, even if they are seminomatous types, have more methylation. And cisplatin resistant um, tumors have higher expression of the de novo uh, methyltransferase DNMT3B. And so currently in the extracranial germ cell tumor world, there's lots of work and clinical trials coming around using demethylation methods to try to reestablish reestablish um, cisplatin sensitivity. And so this um, graph is just showing that you do have high expression of DNMT3P, and this was um, orthotopic mouse models using the DNA demethylator guidocytabine that showed you can resensitize um, cisplatin resistant cell lines um, to, to sense cisplatin if you also treat them with guidocytabine. So as I mentioned, in the extra um, cranial world, we are using this, but this potentially um, could be something that could be investigated in the intracranial world um, if there are patients that have cisplatin sensitive uh, in, uh, resistance. So um, that, uh, those are the ways that normal development can be altered and can also be linked to studying germ cell tumor genesis in ways that we can utilize this to be, to be um, to find therapeutic or diagnostic type stuff. So this is just um, in conclusion, reviewing some of the similarities and differences that we have between extracranial and intracranial germ, germ cell tumors. So the similarities are, it's, it's pretty well accepted that they are the same cell of origin, the primordial germ cell. They have the same histologic subtypes across them some of them occurring in different frequency, but still all of the histologies are representative. And both have been identified to have heritable risk factors within multiple SNPs with some overlap between some of the SNPs. And there are similar somatic uh, mutations and epigenetic marks between um, the germ cell tumors, whether they are intracranial, extracranial. Some of the differences are actually quite subtle um, in that we see similar marks, but the frequency is really um, some of the changes. So the frequency of histology types differ between the two types. Um, as most of you know, two thirds of intracranial germ cell tumors are germinomas, um, whereas only about 50 to 60% of testicular germ cell tumors are seminomas. And this is mostly in the older age group, um, you know, one, big susceptibility low side difference that we've noted is that although back one is um, plays a role in both, the actual SNP location is different. And this is different based on, at least from what we can tell, some ethnicity differences and how can we learn more about why certain groups are, are enriched in certain locations of germ cell tumors. Um, the frequency of copy number alterations is higher in testicular germ cell tumors, but the chromosomal changes are the same between them. And the frequency of pathway alterations are actually higher in intracranial than they are in the extracranial. But this is potentially related to the increased rate of germinoma. As I mentioned, seminomatous and germinomatous have higher kit alterations. And maybe this is why we're seeing this difference in that it isn't actually a true difference in biology. And we can probably use some overlap that we see for treatment of extracranial into intracranial um, tumors as well. So with that, I'd like to thank my group um, at the Jackson Lab and Connecticut Children's, as well as some of the germ cell consortiums that I work with. And um, so in, including the uh, Malignant Germ Cell um, International Consortium or MAGIC, um, this group is really an international group of um, a wide variety of anywhere from basic scientists to clinicians that have a deep interest in germ cell tumors. Initially, this started as a group that focused mostly on extracranial, but we really have been trying to pull in intracranial um, 
uh, work into this as well. And hopefully that will continue to develop because as we mentioned, there's a lot of biology overlap and likely a lot of treatment overlap. Um, and we've really been making some advances in the extracranial world on some new treatment options. And hopefully we can bring that intracranially as well. Uh, as well as I'd like to um, acknowledge some of my funding sources for my work, um, the Cure Search Young Investigator Award, a Department of Defense Career Development World and the Shanfield Family Funds. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, for a fantastic talk. Um, because Joanna has clinical duty, so she has to return to the hospital very soon. So we uh, decided to have the uh, questions and answer periods immediately following her talk now. So you can continue to type in your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I think there's one one general area of questions that most people are interested in, and that is um, how did the putative uh, transform cells uh, end up in all these different organs? Obviously, gonads is easier to explain. <laughs> uh, brain is more challenging to explain based on the normal uh, development. So we have one question already uh, here asking, which do you think is more fundamentally uh, different between the mismigration of PGCs or the failure of apoptosis of the uh, PGCs? You want to comment yeah. on that? Yeah, um, you know, I don't know that there's one that's more fundamental than the other. I think they probably work together as I mentioned, um, and that's probably from the susceptibility aspect of it, where, you know, the outside of just normal germ cell development genes that are altered in the susceptibility loci, um, the next group is, you know, kit and kit ligand, which are important for not only for germ cell survival and proliferation, but also very important for migration of the germ cell. And then even within the backs, BCL2 and a number of the apoptotic regulation genes are also altered in um, in the susceptibility low side to germ cell tumors. And so, and as I mentioned, it's not like one high penetrant strain, like how you have like the BRCA gene in, um, in uh, breast cancer or, or whatnot. It's a, you know, within a one patient, there can be a multitude of these low penetrance genes that are working together to kind of give you a risk for developing um, potentially an extra cranial or I mean an extra gonadal germ cell tumor. So it's a probably a combination of both having altered apoptotic signaling, altered migratory and survival signaling. And then this allows the PGC to um, survive in an area that you would think that, you know, during normal development, there's probably a number of cells that go to the wrong location to the abnormal niche, but the normal signaling would be to die because you're not in your niche, but these alterations allow them to still survive and stay almost dormant for a number of time. And it'll, probably only if you acquire these somatic mutations, then you will fully transform into a germ cell tumor. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. And then there's a uh, other question that's interesting as well. And that is, what is the reason for the difference in the disease occurrence between genders? Yeah, you know, I think that is a question that a lot of folks <laughs> um, are still uh, trying to figure out. You know, as, as mentioned, um, we see the the age gender difference is really the most striking post puberty right like you see this really really high incidence cuz the although there's a female predominance in this younger age group the the difference isn't quite as striking as we see in these post pubertal patients and so you know there are a little bit of sex determination genes that are altered a teeny bit of like sex hormonal genes that are altered but they're not like super striking and no one's been able to say like you know this is an androgen receptor or something that really makes it be such striking between the sexes that causes it to be this difference. So I think that's really a um, an area that we don't quite know why we see that. It's been a little difficult to study it um, and see that. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know that I have a great reason for that yet. I could offer some speculations as well. Uh, and that is, well, first of all, we know that Kleinfelder's disease patients have a higher risk of 
developing uh, germ cell tumors. In addition, in our uh, series of uh, copy number analysis, we found that very high percentage of uh, intracranial germ cell tumor patients uh, have an extra uh, X. Uh, X chromosome yeah. in the tumor. Mm-hmm. That's somatic though, not the crime yeah. family type. And then we also discover in our nature paper that one of the germline variants that seems to show a very high correlation with um, uh, germ cell tumor is uh, JMJD1C, which uh, have been uh, studied by a number of groups, including several Japanese uh, investigators, demonstrating that in mouse models, if you knock out uh, JMJD1C, you can lead to infertility uh, in the male. <clears throat> Again, suggesting that there may be some connection between germ cell tumor pathogenesis and the male fertility as well. So whether that would offer some hints as to why there is such an obvious uh, gender difference uh, remains to be seen. Yeah, yeah, it could just be, you know, um, and I think one of, there are some differences of the ultimate end step between male and female germ cell development and certain genes are more critical and not not as critical and things like that. So that could be play, you be playing a role in, um, although it could be altered in both sexes from a susceptibility or even a somatic line, the the temporal sort of alteration could be um, could be pushing it towards one sex more than the other, um, causing more, um, you know, like one thing that we haven't looked into a ton of is what are the differences in some of the meiosis and mitosis genes and things like that. And that is a little bit in the susceptibility loci stuff that could also alter the ultimate fully differentiate whether or not your germ cell truly fully differentiates um, after you've had sex determination and things like that. And could be, um, I, I work with another group that's also working on like truly what are the risk in the, in the individuals that have, um, disorders of sexual development. And as we learn more about that, um, that might help us learn, you know, which, which groups, why we have, we see a difference in the sexes too, as we learn more about that. Um, There's another question that is already thinking ahead (laughs) and saying, can microRNA be used to monitor treatment response and also suspected uh, relapse cases? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, this this work started in the extracranial world, and it certainly is um, ex- um, being used um, a lot more commonly in this. So it has not been a clinically um, defined test, um, but the trials coming down the pipeline for the extracranial patients are incorporating microRNA levels, um, drop, identifying it again during periods of relapse to sort of run our clinical trials. And so, but from at least case reports or case series, yes, it can be used um, as um, to help monitor response and suspected um, relapses. It just hasn't been fully um, studied enough to say definitively, this is what we should be using, but it is getting closer to that. And hopefully we'll also bring that into the intracranial world. And from proof of principle, both from stuff that we've done in Dr. Lau's in my lab, as well as what the small groups, uh, at least what the Murray group has done with some intracranial stuff, um, it can be identified. Like as you treat patients, you can watch microRNAs drop. And as you suspect it coming back, you can see, you can identify it again in their CRM or CSF. Um, and the nice thing about the kinetics of microRNA um, especially compared to AFP, um, you know, the half-life of microRNAs are minutes to hours. Um, they're very, very short half-life and you can see a pretty precipitous drop. Um, whereas as you know, like AFP can take seven to 10 days to, you know, have that drop. And so it might be more, you know, that might be the reason why it's a little bit more sensitive or specific um, for them. Um, so, yeah, so I think that would be our hopes that that would be a nice way to um, monitor response and and relapse. Sounds like there is good potential for those type of clinical applications mm-hmm. using uh, microRNA. Uh, Akira wants you to comment on any specific causes during germ cell tumor development. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest, like, you know, I think the biggest crit critical step is, although we don't see, um, is the sort of copy number alteration potentially that really transforms a cell um, to it. So we do know, like, from the testicular world, like, isochrome um, 12P can be found in the even, like, precancerous lesions. So I think that sort of genome... I don't want to call it fully instability, but a little instability is what what turns a germ cell that's susceptible just from having a genomic germline susceptibility into a true tipping over to a true tumor genesis um, of the tumors. Although that has um, yet to be definitively defined, we're hoping with like the sort of uh, stem cell to PGC type marker stuff that we can definitively show what what's the critical alteration that happens to to turn something into um, a germ cell, um, but I, that those are probably some of the earlier events, more so even likely prior to what like a KIT or a KRAS mutation occurring. Um, because again, you can see in the precursor lesions that we see in the testes that if the tumor has like a kit or KRAS mutation, it's not always in their pre-cancerous lesion, but the sort of chromosomal aberrations or copy number alterations can be identified pretty early on. I think it's and whether fair there's to... some sort of environmental or trigger, that is also an area that a lot of people are in research um, in um, to see like what's that sort of what's making these be a little unstable to acquire these alterations? I think it's safe to say that the extracranial and the intracranial germ cell tumor uh, biologists certainly can help one another to understand the, uh, the pathogenesis. And we're happy that you are actually working in both areas. So you can help uh, facilitate that kind of cross-fertilization of ideas. We better let you go back to the hospital. I know you have a, a, a number of patients waiting to see. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Or thank you. Uh, in Asia, it's evening. <laughs> so I will now turn over the time to uh, Dr. Alice Yu to uh, introduce the next speaker. Oh, by the way, forgot to mention, now that uh, Dr. Joanna is finished with her talk, we can uh, combine the Q&A session after both uh, Dr. Wong's talk and my talk. Alice, turn it over to you. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Dr. Tai Tong Wong, um, <clears throat> who is a professor. Actually, you know, he is best known as the best pediatric neurosurgeon in Taiwan. Uh, he is currently a professor at the um, tai Taipei Medical University Hospital. Uh, he's also the director of Department of Pediatric Neurology and Neurosurgery uh, and Brain Tumor Program at the Taipei Cancer Center. Um, professor Wong actually has uh, uh, been a leader in pediatric neurosurgeon, um, you know, for more than two de decades. He is the past president of uh, many society. I won't go through all of them, but uh, just uh, mention a few. Asian Australian Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery, uh, Taiwan Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery, and International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery and so forth, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, thanks to his leadership, he uh, three years ago, uh, exactly actually from December, um, he initiated uh, the Taiwan Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium. Um, so we are very grateful to his uh, leadership in uh, pushing the uh, brain tumor in children forward. Uh, let's welcome uh, Tai Tong Wong. Uh, Alice, thank you for very much for your introduction. Uh, I share my slides. 
So also thank you for the invitation uh, for this uh, uh, web panelist on uh, pediatric brain tumors. My topic tonight is the clinical analysis and molecular investigation of genetic germ cell tumors, a cohort series experience in Taiwan. Can you change that to full screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, full screen. So this is our my outline for tonight's uh, talks. Uh, for the uh, age standardized uh, rates for millions uh, in, uh, in children with uh, germ cell tumor in Asia, it's very from 2.3 to 4.9 uh, in from Taiwan, Japan, and Korea. But in Taiwan, the number is underestimated because only malignant cancers were suggested and the historical verification is 95.5%. Regarding to uh, uh, series uh, uh, reports, uh, in the three, uh, areas in uh, Asia, Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, the incidence rates in uh, each series in uh, brain tumors in children, germ cell tumors, range from 10.6% to 14% uh, in Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. The sex ratio is uh, from 1.7 to 3.8% uh, male to female ratio. When we compare the cohort series in Taiwan compared with the report of SEER study in 2009, uh, you can see the, uh, the age distributions uh, in male and female are very much correlated with the uh, SEER studies. If we separate to germinoma and long germ germ cell tumors, uh, you can also see the difference between germinoma uh, in males and females. Uh, for long germ germ cell tumor, there's always two peaks of uh, uh, I mean the incidence, uh, the first years of life and uh, adolescence. The second is clinical heterogeneity and molecular heterogeneity of synapse germ cell tumors. In our series, uh, a series of three, 326 cases in children aged 0 to 19 in type A reactants and TMUH uh, in the past uh, 50 years uh, collections. Histological verification is 73.3%, hydrocephalus and dialysis of 54.3%, intracranial tumor uh, majority uh, more than 99%. For those tumors occur in the first year of life, it's extraordinary, ordinarily it's all after trauma, either mature or immature to tumors. Um, also, we uh, classify uh, these germ cell tumors. Uh, you can see the heterogeneity of tabs and subtabs. For germinomas, uh, in our series, only 60.8% has uh, histological word find. Uh, for long germ germ cell tumor, uh, it's more than 90% uh, uh, histological uh, verifies. Our interest in some specific uh, types of uh, long germ germ cell tumor, like immature tumor, we can divide two age groups less than one year or older than one year. Uh, for those older than one year, a uh, few cases has normal alpha fetoprotein. Uh, the behavior is different between, uh, from those with elevated alpha fetoprotein in older child. And also for going to a tumor syndrome, uh, germ cell tumor with somatic time malignancy, uh, the incidence rate is uh, more than, uh, we have eight patients uh, in uh, long term germ cell tumors. For going to the Thomas syndrome, the incidence is all in long germ germ cell tumor, uh, seven to 127. In our uh, series, 
our reference value of serum HCG and other fetoprotein is HCG less than 10 uh, uh, micro international units and other fetoprotein less than 20 nanogram uh, uh, per ml. We look at uh, for our series of germ germlomas that included uh, germ cell tumor with without syncytial uh, 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 sign cells, and, uh, and also uh, including those without uh, pathological confirmations, including the, the series with uh, uh, markers, uh, XCG higher than 10 uh, international, uh, micro, uh, micro international units, and other fetoprotein less than 20 nanogram per ml. And also including two uh, unconfirmed tumors with normal tumor markers. In few cases, uh, the, all the, the, these patients ha has no tumor marker studies, but uh, still uh, we classify uh, as a germinoma because of the imaging uh, features. You can see that the, di uh, the survival is interesting for those with normal tumor markers and low tumor markers survival is high compared to those with uh, elevated markers and also um, those to uh, compare to those with histological diagnosis. When we look at uh, these four groups of germinomas, you can find uh, uh, this is a pathological confirmed group but for those uh, with tumor markers elevated and normal tumor markers, low tumor marker, you can see very often we can see this kind of uh, so-called multiple size and uh, so-called uh, subdependable spread uh, cases in these three groups. Uh, regarding to uh, uh, mixed germ cell tumors, we starting by the leading 50, more than 50% components are divided into germ cell tumor many, to tumor many, and uh, malignant germ cell tumor many, and also uh, uh, the somatic type malignancy. For somatic type malignancy, uh, they're including uh, sarcomas, uh, associated tumors, and also adenocarcinomas. For uh, intracranial, uh, so for going to tumor syndromes, uh, this uh, this tumors occurs uh, almost uh, in non germ marine germ cell tumors, and also uh, six of the seven uh, with elevated serum uh, our fetoprotein. The onset of uh, uh, going to tumor syndrome from dialysis mediums two point four months. Uh, with after surgical resection, with uh, gross total resection five. Uh, or a partial resection too. The pathologies are uh, almost uh, mature tetoma or mixed mature tetoma, immature tetomas. Uh, so uh, after treatment, uh, the survival is six. One die because of yolk sac tumor recurrence. The medium four times eight to eight point two years. And also, uh, we have 61 patients with uh, molecular profiling, either RNA sequencing or uh, DNA methylation array. Uh, you can see that uh, according to the histopathology sub, uh, groups and subgroups, the gene expression is quite different between um, uh, historical diagnosis. Uh, regarding to uh, immature tetoma, for infants uh, with immature teratoma are usually huge tumors, but tumors uh, can be resected. And uh, the recurrence tumor without any treatments usually become a mature teratoma. It's quite interesting. Many of these tumors did not need a further chemo uh, radiation therapy uh, after uh, resections and recurrence resections. Uh, for the other, uh, type of patients, it is a 2.5 years uh, 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 child. Uh, the first resection immature to Thomas, but recur uh, with further resection become a mature to toma, and no further treatment, the patient survive eventually survival for 15 years. So the behavior of this type of immature to toma without without elevated serum tumor markers looks like benign tumors. 
this the, the third thing is, is that for older child, uh, if we with immature teratoma, we have elevated serum uh, alpha fetoprotein. Uh, this part type patient require extensive radiation and chemotherapy, and um, uh, some of these patients uh, even fail after treatment. And we look at the molecular difference, although, although the lumbus is small. This is the infant's uh, uh, immature teratoma. Is the uh, immature teratoma in an older child uh, with not normal of a fetoprotein? It is the one immature teratoma in an older child. You can see the uh, uh, EMT genes are quite different, and also the metastatic genes are quite different between these three uh, immature teratomas. We also have interesting to look at the so-called germ cell tumor with uh, somatic type malignancies. This one example is uh, a germinoma mixed with a uh, hepatocellular cell carcinoma. Uh, this patient are successfully treated by uh, uh, treatment protocols according to hepatocellular uh, hepatocellular carcinomas. The another case is adenocarcinomas. This child, the first diagnosis is immature teratoma. Local recurrence become mixed germ cell tumor with yolk sac tumor components. Survive for 18 years, finally become a uh, malignant <coughs> transformation to adenocarcinomas. So uh, mm -hmm. we're also interested to know uh, that what kind of uh, uh, EMT marker uh, expression of this type of uh, so-called somatic time malignancy. And the third is then for going to trauma syndrome, uh, very few cases present uh, with a uh, uh, so-called recurrence and recurrence become a uh, pure yolk sac tumors. So uh, from the beginning of the tumor resection, can we find some of this, uh, the genes related to this uh, malignant tumors and recurrence? Uh, regarding to the location of the tumors, uh, we have uh, tumors in, located in the pineal region, neural hypophysis, basal gangrene, bifocal, and also multiple site or infiltrations, ventricle, spine, or others. Uh, this tumor located in different locations, big or small, but very typically, it is this kind of tumor with diffuse of dependable disseminations, uh, all are classified into germinoma, and the treatment re response is very good. Uh, we, we, look, we look at the, I mean, the different I mean, subtypes, germ cell tumor subtypes in different locations. Pineal uh, over about 50% are long germ, germ cell tumors, but for multiple size, 100% are germ cell uh, germinomas. Ventricle tumor are all teratomas. So uh, also, if you look at the uh, tumor markers, for germinoma, there's no, uh, I mean, uh, cutting point for uh, the, uh, the uh, titers of serum alpha uh, uh, beta CG. And also for immature teratoma, sometimes the, this uh, uh, alpha protein with some cases here are sky high, but it is original ready, uh, uh, this uh, ARP are high in newborn babies. Uh, so this expression of a fetoprotein doesn't mean anything for malignancy, but for immature teratoma over than one year old, uh, the presentation of, uh, of a fetoprotein elevation represent a tumor malignancy. For mixed germ cell tumor, can have both elevation of uh, beta CG and alpha fetoprotein, uh, even more than 2,000 uh, units. For yolk sac tumors, also choriocarcinoma are rare in our series. Regarding to the staging of the uh, intracranial germ cell tumor, uh, if uh, we compare to Western cities, uh, the incidence for germ cellular uh, will be 19% uh, with uh, I mean, either CSF or a macro, uh, macroscopic, metal, macroscopic metastasis. And for long germ, germ cell tumor is also high as, high as 22%. 
For us, we do not account for cytologies uh, for German loma, only uh, the tumor metastasis diagnosis, the diagnosis only 11.1%. Uh, if we exclude multiple sites, uh, the incidence will be 6%. For long term meningeal cell tumor, the incidence is low. Uh, for I mean, by imaging study, it's 2.7%. Uh, why is this difference between uh, West and East and our, uh, our data? And also, for those uh, tumor with uh, germinoma with diffuse of ependymal dissemination, should we count it as metastasis or as uh, uh, bifocal tumor? It is not a metastatic tumor. In our treatments, we just give extend focal radiation is enough to control this type of tumor uh, uh, effectively. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, tumors, non germ germ cell tumor can be very high vascular. It is the danger of surgery. For the therapeutic approach and survival. So uh, since 2013, it is the, the third international CNS germ cell tumor symposium in Cambridge. Uh, they agreed to uh, undertake a multidisciplinary uh, Delphi process to identify consensus in clinical management of intracranial germ cell tumors. The consensus uh, 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 comes out in 2015. In 2022, both Japan and uh, Europe uh, has their own, uh, I mean, the guidelines for the uh, diagnosis treatment of the germ cell tumors. Uh, in Taiwan, since 2020, in June, we study, start to have discussion uh, to uh, build up our consensus and guidelines of diagnosis management of uh, intracranial germ cell tumors. However, whether we need to have historical diagnosis in all senior germ cell tumor is still controversial. Um, for the management difference between germinoma and long germ germ cell tumor, uh, uh, on one way is the germinoma is highly radio sensitive, uh, long germ germ cell tumor less radio sensitive. Uh, uh, thus, the, uh, the the extent and uh, uh, of uh, the, the 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 area uh, uh, and extent of radiation is lower uh, in germ loma compared to long germ germ cell tumor. Uh, also, for metastasis diagnosis, uh, cranial viral radiation is effective for the treatment of germ loma, uh, but for long germ germ cell tumor, uh, usually the purpose is to lower. Uh, tumor burdens, and also uh, we suggest a high dose chemo with uh, 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 the locus uh, stem cell rescue. Uh, for survival, uh, usually it's better for germinoma, but uh, after 30 years, the survival will drop because of the radiation complications. Uh, for long term germ cell tumor, usually uh, the survival is correlated with the malignancy of the type of the long term germ cell tumors. So this is our uh, uh, survival curve for uh, uh, mature teratoma, germinoma, and long-term malignant cell tumors. And also the survival difference between different uh, malignants of sub, uh, mixed germ cell tumor subtypes, uh, subtype one, two, and three depends on the components of the malignancy. And also uh, the survival for uh, so-called uh, somatic malignancy is quite uh, uh, lost as good as the other types. Uh, regarding to new psycho psychological profiling, uh, we can see both germinoma and uh, a long germ germ cell tumor has uh, has uh, some some in has influence to collective functions uh, because maybe germinoma and infiltrative tumor that may infiltrate if some of the uh, uh, collective function because of tumor infiltrations for long germ germ cell tumor may be due to the higher radiation dosage, higher radiation do uh, areas. So regarding molecular analysis, uh, uh, we have 61 uh, intra uh, uh, cases uh, of this disease uh, with uh, molecular analysis. Uh, we, our interest is correlate molecular expression with specific 
clinical observations. Uh, uh, we have two interests. One's uh, germinoma with diffuse of ependymal spread, and uh, the second is radio resistance in non germ germ cell tumors. Uh, so, uh, so uh, we perform a so called uh, uh, so called uh, like a, a gene expression model and analysis uh, in germinoma. Is the expression is um, uh, enhanced in DNA damage checkpoint and immune systems. Uh, but uh, for long term, germ cell tumors, tumors, the cell motility and neuronal differentiations. Uh, in our previous studies, uh, we found that for germinoma, uh, it's a stemless tumor with a, a, a high expression of uh, stemless genes and also high expression of MP12. Uh, for long term, germ cell tumor, is a high expression of just, uh, the two cardinal uh, EMT genes, uh, STELS and TRIS2. And uh, so uh, for this, uh, because the multiple sites uh, uh, is uh, uh, about uh, 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 multiple sites are all adrenomous and all is uh, the behavior light uh, is very, uh, I mean, the survival is very good. Uh, but it is very specific. We would like to know well, how, why these tumors are infiltrative, uh, but the behavior is so benign. This is all the this kind of patients showing uh, very diffuse uh, 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 paraventricular, periventricular infiltrations, extensive. Uh, if you treat it like um, a so-called metastatic tumor, you give final spiral access radiations, maybe we over-treat these patients. Uh, this just behave like bifocal uh, germinoma. Uh, for this patient, you see this uh, diffuse, diffuse time of a uh, uh, germinoma, and uh, after extended focal radiation plus uh, 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 a, a whole ventricle radiation and focal booster, uh, the, the, the tumor all gone. Uh, if there's no intraspinal seeding, we do not give spinal radiations. And, uh, and uh, so uh, we look at for germinoma, uh, why this, this tumor has uh, uh, that kind of uh, in, infiltration potentials. Is that related to MMP12 uh, and also the family? Uh, but uh, uh, we, we cannot prove it yet. And um, if you look at, uh, I mean, so-called uh, cells, uh, uh, immune cells, uh, microenvironments uh, for germinomas uh, all belong to uh, T cell and B cell uh, enrichment, but for long, for long germ, germ cell tumor, especially yolk cell tumor, they expresses mainly on monocyte and macrophage. And we look at uh, the only one case uh, with a diffuse of ependymal uh, disseminations. And the expression is no in immune landscape, this one. And also mm -hmm. low expression of PD1 and PDR1. And also high expression metastasis. So uh, we should uh, uh, find time and some uh, more material to study uh, 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 these uh, conditions. Uh, regarding to radio resistance of malignant long -term, term cell tumors, uh, uh, because of the uh, long term, term cell tumor require higher dosage and uh, maybe higher areas uh, volume of uh, radiations, uh, but the process is not as good as uh, germinoma. Uh, because uh, uh, the uh, TJ beta testway are uh, alone for, uh, I mean, the radiation malignancy uh, resistance. Uh, we look at the uh, TZ beta expression is higher in long term germ cell tumors. And also, we proved that the TJ beta signaling pathway genes are, are high expressed by RT PCR study. And also, uh, we also uh, throw uh, gene analysis, we can find that the BMP24 
uh, ALK1, SMAC158, uh, IB123, and uh, 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 active in CNS, CNS non germ germ cell tumors. So uh, our uh, interest is to, to perform a translational research on a targeted therapy of radio resistance and de escalate radiotherapy for malignant long germ germ cell tumors. And also, we try to explore radio resistance genes. So, uh, we first compare pure uh, Yorkshire tumor with germ germ loma. We find two uh, uh, other genes, SBMP2 and CPG, C, uh, GPC3. And also expand to uh, Yorkshire tumor and mixed Yorkshire tumor compared to uh, germinoma. We find more of these genes like BMP2, uh, GB33, HNF4 alpha, RGS, LR1, uh, uh, SHC1. So uh, uh, we also try to explore the, those uh, long germ germ cell tumor with high expression of BMP2. Uh, compared with germinoma, we find more genes like uh, 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 two hubs, one's BMP2 and one's uh, FN1 and the related genes. Uh, uh. So uh, as we find that uh, both EMT pathway, angiogenesis pathway, hypoxia pathway, TGF-beta pathway are enriched uh, in long germ germ cell tumor, uh, we perform a uh, uh, gene network analysis of these four <coughs> pathways. We can find uh, several these are uh, the potential radio resistant genes. And also, we find that uh, HNF4 alpha, FN1, uh, GPC3, and VGF alpha is co expressed with BMP2 in CNJ uh, long germ germ cell tumors. And uh, we further perform our uh, survival analysis. Uh, these potential genes are showing a uh, uh, poor growth uh, uh, in long -term, term cell tumors. We also uh, look at the uh, public data. Uh, these genes are also related to poor porosis. So uh, we confirm these uh, several uh, potential radio resistant genes in Yorkshire tumor only in one cases, and these uh, uh, genes are highly expressed uh, in Yorkshire tumors. So we think that uh, the Yorkshire tumor one of the representative malignant germ cell tumors uh, for radio resistance uh, research. We should focus on the Yorkshire tumor and mixed Yorkshire tumors uh, for the radio resistant genes. So uh, for, uh, we developed the tumor cell culture or organoid culture of uh, intracranial germ cell tumor as tool for these uh, studies. Uh, we uh, now have uh, 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 more than 14 uh, uh, primary cell cultures. We try to establish the organoid cultures uh, and to expand our research tools. This is it, uh, the organic cultures. Uh, you can see these uh, uh, cells uh, in, a, in a spheres, uh, either germinoma or uh, mixed germ cell tumors. Also, we uh, established radiation assays. Uh, for in uh, primary cell cultures, uh, if we, uh, we give radiation to these cells, we can see uh, radiation induced uh, radio resistance, uh, such as BMP2 uh, elevated, FN1 elevated, SXC1 elevated. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we look at uh, if it's possible to have an uh, inhibitor. We use uh, uh, BMP2 inhibitors in a, uh, one uh, primary cell cultures in mixed um, uh, Yorkshire tumors, uh, we can see that the uh, IC50 absorbs down uh, after using of BMP2 uh, inhibitors. That, that means that we'll be hope that uh, some of this, uh, I mean, radio resistant gene uh, uh, that related uh, inhibitor can help. These are our conclusions. Senior uh, germ cell tumor heterogeneous in both clinical and molecular heterogeneity. A clinical analysis in a large clinical cost series is reported today. 
we perform molecular clinical survival analysis in a series of 61 cases as molecular investigation of the co cohort series. We are interested in the investigation of the different molecular expression of specific germ cell tumor subtypes, like germinoma, immature teratoma, somatic type, and legacy. Our translation research focuses on deciphering and identification of radio resistant genes in malignant long germ germ cell tumor for targeted treatment, uh, targeted treatment therapies and this the escalating radio therapy. Our research tool is to establish of primary cell culture and organ culture uh, of intracranial uh, uh, intracranial germ cell tumor. And also, we will report our preliminary result today for opinions and comments. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, review of germ cell tumor in Taiwan from clinical to molecular level. Um, if you have any question, you can write in the question and answer. A panel, but we will hold the uh, discussion until the end after Dr. Ching Lok's talk. Okay, so uh, let's thank Dr. Wong for now and move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ching Lok. Um, previously, you know, um, our chair, Guthrie Chen, has already introduced to you uh, about Dr. Raw, and he really does not need much introduction. I would only add, I mean, you know, we know he's an excellent uh, uh, physician scientist, uh, pediatric oncologist with special love for brain tumor and the bone, uh, especially osteosarcoma. But I would only add to the introduction uh, of uh, Godfrey's comment that uh, he actually uh, was should be congratulated for successfully getting a, an award through the NIH Kids First the program to study the genetic predisposition of intracranial germ cell tumor. Uh, let's welcome Professor Law. Thank you very much, Alice, for the generous comments. Uh, it's all teamwork. I, I, I always say that, um, uh, especially dealing with uh, rare tumors like uh, germ cell tumors. It really requires uh, global um, collaborations. Now, my assignment today is not germ cell tumor, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have been uh, assigned the topic on ependymoma instead, which is also a very fascinating tumor. And what I want to do today is to tell you just one story that we have been involved in uh, to try to unravel the mysteries of um, the uh, fusion positive type of uh, supertentorial ependymoma. Okay, so this... Jim, please go to the full screen. Oh, yeah. Let me do that. Okay, now we can get started. So uh, this work was started uh, when I was still at um, Baylor College of Medicine and continue on after I moved to uh, Jackson Lab. And these are my disclosures. So just to serve as an uh, introduction, um, Epidemoma is a neuroepithelial tumor predominantly in, found in children and young adults. It counts for about 8 to 10% of all intracranial tumors and 40 to 60% of spinal cord tumors. Five-year overall survival is not that great, 55%, primarily due to some late uh, recurrences. And progression-free survival is also uh, suboptimal, 35%. Currently, the standard of care is still surgery followed by radiation. Uh, the role of chemotherapy has not been well established despite uh, two uh, large uh, uh, clinical trials uh, conducted by the Children's Oncology Group, as well as many other international investigators who, uh, who will try to uh, uh, establish the role of chemotherapy. 
Uh, at one point, the uh, prognostic uh, markers used were the extent of surgical resection. If it's gross total resection, the prognosis is much better. The age also uh, probably is related to the distribution of the tumor uh, anatomically uh, in correlation with age. Uh, histologic grade at one point was somewhat controversial. Uh, it was not sure whether the histologic grade uh, has impact on the um, prognosis, but I think now that we have more cases to work with, uh, it seems that the grade does matter. And obviously the location of the primary tumor, uh, if it's posterior fossa is a little bit more tricky to achieve uh, gross total resection. And then proliferation and apoptosis has always been something lurking in the background. Uh, these are the uh, typical survival curves on the uh, left-hand side uh, is overall survival based on a degree of resection. As you could see clearly, uh, degree of resection uh, is prognostically significant. And then in terms of progression-free survival, that holds up as well. And this is based on uh, grading now, as I mentioned before, uh, overall survival it's pretty clear that there is um, uh, impact of the histologic grade, but progression-free survival uh, is not that obvious. And then the ependymoma can be subtyped based on, first of all, location. As I mentioned, supertentorial versus infratentorial versus spinal. And then um, in terms of histologic grade, it can be uh, divided into three. Mixopapillary is grade one. Um, grade two is well differentiated ependymoma, and then uh, grade three is anaplastic um, subtype. So these are the typical histologic uh, features of uh, ependymoma. The uh, most useful uh, feature is the perivascular pseudo rosettes. Um, and then sometimes you could see necrosis, um, and that would help to. Uh, uh, define the uh, histologic grade, as well as the uh, vascular proliferation. So very similar to histologic grading criteria of uh, gliomas. So back in 2014, we already knew that um, there, there are not that many uh, mutations found by DNA sequencing. However, if you do RNA sequencing, it's pretty obvious that with the supertentorial uh, subtype, uh, we do see the presence of uh, fusion uh, transcripts, uh, mostly involving this uh, gene at that time, C11 of 95, um, together with REL A being the other partner. And you don't see this at all in posterior fossa type of ependymoma. And REL A is a well known gene because it's the transcription factor involved in the uh, uh, NF kappa B pathway. Uh, typically, it's uh, sequestered uh, in the cytoplasm by I kappa B unless the cells are stimulated from the outside by uh, cytokines like uh, TNF alpha. Then it will be released from uh, I kappa B and then they migrate into the uh, nucleus and turn on uh, other genes. So because of this well-known um, uh, biology and its obvious role in uh, inflammation as well as uh, certain types of uh, uh, lymphomas, uh, everybody initially assumed that uh, REL-A is probably the uh, dictating partner in this fusion. Uh, here on the left is to uh, depict the um, uh, structure of the fusion. Uh, so here are the wild type uh, uh, partners. So LA is over here. C11 of 95 is here. And there's another partner, uh, YAP1, that could fuse with 11, uh, C11 of 95 in a smaller percentage of the cases. Majority of the supertentorial ependymoma have this kind of a fusion, which includes almost the entire REL A gene, except for two amino acids at the five prime end, plus one of the three um, 
uh, two uh, uh, two out of five of the uh, axons of C11 of 95 and fuse together uh, to form this uh, fusion protein, which is pretty large. And then here's the uh, stru equivalent structure of uh, C11 of 95 fusing with uh, YAP1. So for a long time after this was known, uh, we didn't know what the role of this fusion protein is, especially because C11 of 95 uh, is practically unknown uh, gene at that time. So we decided to, uh, uh, oh, here's the uh, summary that about 70% of supertentorial panemoma involved this uh, fusion uh, with uh, REL A. And you can actually create a, a cell and mouse models demonstrating that this fusion alone uh, is enough to drive uh, the uh, supertentorial uh, appendimoma. And for a while, we all felt that NF-kappa B is probably involved because of rel A's presence. Um, and indeed, you can uh, cause tumor genesis in transforming some mouse neural stem cells. So we decided to take a deeper dive into this uh, 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 the biology of this fusion. Uh, so we first created uh, some cell lines in order to uh, dissect the uh, biology of this uh, fusion. Uh, so we created uh, uh, different cell lines based on HEC293 cells. Uh, we transfect just the REL A component with the uh, HA tag. Um, and then we create another cell line with just the C11 of 95. And then finally, one cell line that uh, we transfected with uh, the fusion uh, 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 gene itself. We have to add the HA tag because uh, at that time, there was no uh, commercially available antibody that can adequately uh, uh, detect the C11 of 95 component. So to facilitate all the studies that we need to do downstream, we have to create this type of cell lines. Uh, so we did RNA-seq, chip-seq, and high chip to try to uh, decipher uh, what the role of these, uh, this um, uh, fusion gene is. Uh, fortunately, at that time, we also had created a um, orthotopic xenograph model uh, of uh, uh, supertentorial pandemoma that also carries the same uh, fusion. So we always use this uh, cell line as a validation of the findings that we uh, made in these artificially created cell lines. So these are just um, documentation that indeed the um, different cell lines that we created uh, express the um, uh, uh, appropriate uh, uh, transcript that we uh, uh, put in. And these are the sequencing to confirm the presence of the uh, of the fusion, and then comparing the uh, HEC two ninety three cells that we created with the actual human appendimoma cell line that we created through the uh, xenograph model. So the first thing we uh, confirmed was that uh, actually C eleven of ninety five by itself can easily diffuse into the um, nucleus. Um, and this is very important for us because at one point we all thought that REL A was the uh, driving uh, factor, but we also know that REL A by itself cannot go into the nucleus unless there's stimulation of the cells by some kind of cytokine. But this one gave us the confirmation that actually it's possible that C11 of 95 is the driving force because it can actually bring the REL A partner into the, uh, to the uh, nucleus. So we did a very simple experiment by uh, fusing the, uh, the C11 off by itself with the clover uh, so that it would stain the, the cells uh, green when it's uh, transfected. And then we use uh, a nuclear stain uh, to confirm the presence of the uh, C11 of 95 in the nuclei. 
you know, as you compare with the controls. So that was very important because even though we know that there is a sink finger motif in C11 of 95, we still have to prove that uh, they can actually get into the uh, nuclei. And then very quickly, we uh, did the chip seek uh, analysis just to find out where this fusion uh, protein is binding to in the chromatin. And so again, we made use of the cell lines that we created uh, to look at this. So we take the cell line that only has the expression of C11 of 95 and did the uh, chip seek. We found more than 38,000 uh, loci that it could bind. And then we also put uh, take the cell lines that have the full fusion uh, expression. And then we found uh, 32,000 um, loci uh, with an overlap of almost 17,000 loci between the two cell lines. And as you could see, if you just use the REL A uh, expressing uh, cell lines that we created, whether with or without um, TNF stimulation, it makes a very minor component, uh, a contribution to the number of foci uh, that uh, could bind this uh, uh, fusion. And here's to just to look at the strength of the uh, binding. Uh, and, and as you could see, even though they share very similar uh, loci uh, that they could bind, but the strength of the uh, binding is much stronger with the uh, full fusion versus just the C11 of uh, 95 component. And this here, we look at the uh, clustering of these uh, loci to see if we could find some common uh, pathways that uh, uh, we could identify. And when we go back, oops, sorry. When we go back and look at the uh, upregulated genes that are associated with the binding uh, of the um, fusion, it's pretty obvious that uh, if we use the uh, cell line that only expresses uh, the C11 of 95, we have uh, very few uh, upregulated genes. Uh, it's at least tripled when we uh, put in the full uh, fusion uh, into the cells. And then when we compare it back to the uh, differentially expressed genes that have been previously published, there were at least 67 uh, such genes um, found. And when you look at the, the identity of these 67 genes, many of them actually have been studied previously uh, in the biology of uh, supertentorial ependymoma, such as L1CAM, CHD5, NOTCH1, etc. So this gives us a, a lot of reassurance that we are uh, looking at the right uh, uh, gene sets now with these artificially created uh, cell lines. And then we very quickly try to establish the binding motifs uh, of um, the uh, fusion and using just C11 of 95, we identify this uh, motif GDGGCCC. And then when we put in the uh, full fusion in the Hex cells, we found this, the same most common motif. And then finally, uh, we validated this with the uh, human cell line again, same motif. Now, because we were still trying to resolve the uh, role of REL A uh, in these uh, 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 tumor cells, we decided to take a step at addressing the hypothesis that perhaps um, REL A is somewhat of a passive passenger by contributing is uh, transactivating domain only because it, the dictating force as to where the fusion protein binds to the chromatin is actually driven by um, C11 off. So basically here, we decided to fuse the uh, uh, green fluorescent protein gene to uh, various constructs, first the C11 off by itself, uh, or uh, um, um, the uh, uh, full fusion itself, or we replace uh, REL A with another unrelated transactivating domain, uh, VP64. And then we created an artificial uh, plasmid that contains multiple copies of this binding motif basically to test the hypothesis that 
we can get rid of rel A and replace it with an unrelated trans activating domain and still get the full expression of the uh, reported gene GFP in this case. So that was very reassuring, again, that uh, we are heading in the right direction, that C11 of 95 is the driving force. And here's just the distribution of the various uh, binding mode uh, peaks. Uh, some of them have a promoter, which is obvious to explain. Some of them actually have the motif, but don't have the, uh, the uh, promoter nearby. Most likely it has something to do with the enhancer sequences. And here down in the bottom here, we again demonstrate that the uh, binding of the uh, of the fusion protein uh, to C11 of 95 itself or to REL A itself, suggesting that this is an autoregulation process, that the protein, the, the fusion protein can drive its own uh, expression uh, as well. So very quickly, we also wanted to verify that the loci where the fusion protein binds actually are also the chromatin uh, activated the regions, confirming that the binding of the fusion protein actually activates uh, these uh, downstream uh, targets. So here we use the human cell line uh, to compare the loci that they bind versus the uh, histone mark for uh, chromatin activation, H3K27 acetylated uh, loci. And you can see that the correlate extremely well. And this is using the artificially created cell line that we made and repeated the same comparison. Again, the um, foci of the H3K27 acetylated um, uh, loci correlate very well with the uh, fusion uh, protein uh, binding. And then we further compare that with individual genes binding. So for example, with L1 cam, uh, which is one of the downstream target gene of the fusion, you can see that uh, the uh, cells that have been transfected with the full fusion uh, show these uh, uh, binding uh, as well as in the uh, human uh, ependymoma cell line, and they correlate extremely well with the uh, acetylated H3K27 marks. Now, versus another type of downstream target CCN D1, cyclin D1, uh, whereby the uh, uh, acetylated histone marks actually remain stable with or without the uh, binding of the uh, uh, fusion protein. And then finally, we uh, make use of these uh, uh, genome wide uh, chromatin uh, uh, analysis technique. In this case, is high chip analysis. Basically, this allows us to scan the entire genome and ask what's the comp impact of the uh, binding of the fusion protein. Uh, does it actually modulate the uh, binding, uh, uh, the uh, chromatin interaction as a result of that? And here we clearly show that uh, uh, these uh, uh, binding of the fusion protein triggers the interaction of multiple loci um, uh, upon the uh, interaction of the fusion protein with the, uh, with the chromatin. And this is a plot here to indicate uh, how many interactions per gene you could see. And as you could see here, CACNA1H, which is a uh, calcium channel uh, gene, well known to be involved in uh, uh, ependymoma biology, uh, notch one, for example, again, they can the binding of the fusion protein leads to multiple uh, interactions with uh, different loci as a result of that. Some of them are involving promoter, and that's very easy to explain, but some of them actually are in areas where there are no promoters known. So most likely it's inducing um, interaction of the enhancer with uh, downstream uh, target genes uh, promoters. So very quickly, I just want to wrap up this to stay on time. Uh, so basically, in conclusion, we, we can see that uh, c 11 of 95 rel a is a novel transcription factor that recognizes specific DNA motif 
dictated by the C11 of uh, 95 partner. The C11 of 95 component allows the constitutive uh, uh, localization of the fusion protein in the nucleus and then drive the transcriptomic activation of target genes by binding to the chromatin with the consensus motif. The railway component is there to stabilize the DNA binding after the fusion uh, protein binds and also provides its activation domain to actually drive the expression of the target genes. So the last thing we found out was that not only that it binds and drives the uh, immediate downstream targets, but it actually changes the chromatin structure such that it actually modulates the chromatin state and mediates further chromatin interaction. And that's the reason why the transcriptomic profiles of uh, C11 of 95 rel A positive uh, ependymoma uh, show such dramatic uh, differences compared to uh, uh, the controls. So we published this paper actually in 2020, uh, but six months following this uh, publication, uh, there were multiple um, papers uh, published uh, corroborating our findings, which is very reassuring. And at the same time, uh, the nomenclature of C11 of 95 uh, changed to ZFTA, which stands for Sing Finger Translocation Activated. Okay, very, <laughs> very, very complicated name. Uh, so these are the multiple uh, papers that published about within the six month period that uh, uh, ours came out. And so really now, right now, I think the conclusion is uh, more or less a consensus now that CFTA itself with its sing finger is the driving force and it's required to drive the malignant process. Uh, and the rel A transactivation domain lends its support by actually uh, activating the, um, the downstream targets. The rel A uh, uh, RHD domain itself it's not required for such uh, um, uh, malignant transformation, but it's part of the uh, rel A gene that got translocated. So these are the acknowledgements. Multiple people contributed significantly uh, to this uh, uh, process. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this fascinating story telling us about uh, uh, this fascinating fusion protein. Yeah, it sounds like the driver, one single driver, right? Does that mean that, uh, you know, this is the perfect target for Portec? Uh, very Take good long. target, yes. Very good target. <laughs> a lot they of people- are, Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> are working on it. It's amazing, just one gene. One, yes, one I know that, gene. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. So now we finally come to the question and answer time. Uh, they, I see that there are several already uh, on the panel. So why don't I go down the list? Okay. Um, we have one for, I guess, initial ones are for uh, Titan. Okay. So after this great research, what genetic genes do you recommend to screen for any germ cell tumor? This is from Haskin Bats. I'm, I'm not sure because uh, uh, not doing the same thing like Ching Lo do uh, for the so JMJ uh, one D or the kind of genes. JMJ we, one we C, see, yeah. yeah, we see this in our series, but the location is different from Japanese uh, locations. So I just hold it here and uh, not doing furthermore. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we can combine our data to do a joint okay. analysis. Right, right. Yeah. 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 We can communicate. We have some data for this. Mm. Yeah. Okay, the next uh, has to do with your spheroid organoid culture. Uh, from based on that research, have you found any novel agent uh, to target the CNS germ cell tumor or non germinous tumor immunoma? So from your organoid culture, 
Have you found any new drug or any drug? Uh, a question to me? Yes. Or to... Yes, that is it. No, uh, we 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 doing an organoid drug uh, study, uh, but uh, we found that uh, even primary cell and organoid, uh, sometimes um the behavior may change, uh, such as uh, regarding to radio resistance. So uh, we are just the beginning. Uh, we only can do very small things. Try to find out the so so called radio resistant genes from EMT major EMT systems, and also uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, uh, the problem is organoid cultures expansion. It takes long time, and also uh, we try to if we can cooperate with some other institute uh, to have this kind of primary cell cultures and organoid culture, then we can expand the volume. Uh, of this kind of uh, uh, study material, uh, it would be better to uh, have a good environment for uh, for this kind of uh, drug resistance uh, test or uh, radiation resistance test or new drugs, uh, I mean, uh, uh, development. Thanks. Can these, uh, uh, this is from myself, okay. Um, <laughs> can these yeah. organoid culture be uh, maintained the long term? Or does it, is it only a short term culture? Uh, uh, actually, we established the organ culture in recent one two years, and uh, seems they go slow but still grows. And now we try to expand the the first uh, few generation to the bigger amount, and then uh, storage there, and uh, so waiting for uh, our. Uh, the, the time we did uh, these cells and organize for study. Uh, that's why uh, we still uh, look forward to collaborate with uh, the centers with good uh, number of germ cell, intracranial germ cell tumors, then we can exchange. Okay. Dr. Jung, did you. you try, did you try hypoxic condition in growing these organoids and, and whether it oh, helps? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, because uh, uh, after the first uh, organoid culture, because uh, we have a colleague, he's, uh, he's good on culture circling cells. He has that kind of uh, organoid culture mediums. Uh, recently, we uh, it's hard to find one uh, technician. Uh, I mean, they, they would like to uh, take long time for this kind of cultures. But now we have a young lady, uh, she works very well. So uh, uh they hopefully yeah you can see uh in these few months we have uh, more primary cell and organoid culture in different uh, subgroup of uh, germ cell tumors. We only do not have yes it's a pure York cell tumor organoid or primary cultures. I look for that because uh the uh, York cell uh, will be a key um in tumor to study uh resistance because you know. Other, I don't. You, you may well. We can we can talk about this offline. But Joanna, okay. in collaboration with our uh, collaborator from Mass General, have yes. developed this uh, growth conditions to maintain BGC like cells at least okay. six months. And yeah. so now we're in the position to do a lot of uh, drug screening, phenotypic okay. manipulations, etc. Okay. So we could share that information with you, and then you can try it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Now, Can I ask a question? Can I ask yes. a question? Yeah, uh, it's very interesting to see your slide about those uh, marker secretions because that exactly uh, point out that uh, the difference in different part of the world uh, between the Europe, the US and the Japanese. Yes. Uh, yes. Because the Japanese does not belong, uh, believe that the uh, beta CG level matter. Uh, then the American uh, said it at 100, <laughs> and the European <laughs> said it on 50. So I can see your pure germinoma, some of them, the, the level is even up to 1,000 or 2,000. <laughs> 2,000, 4,000. Because... Yeah, yeah, 4,000. So, and you, in the other slide, you mentioned that actually it does affect outcome, but is it the alpha fetoprotein or the beta CG that affect the outcome? Uh, alpha fetoprotein. Uh, yeah, so beta CG does not matter, right? Uh, beta CG, uh, you 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 know that 
uh, it, uh, the reference value usually for uh, basic CG uh, is about 10. And for mm -hmm. uh, AFPs is uh, about 25 uh, international. Yeah. But in our review, all this long germ germ cell tumor, uh, other fetoprotein serum is uh, within uh, the zero to 20, uh, rarely over 21. But for those over 21, we just try to go to, uh, into a long germ germ cell tumors. But treatment for germinoma, we should con uh, serious consider uh, 50 uh, micro international units and 100 is artificial. You just decide the levels. But for uh, uh, germinoma, if you have pathology, you can see sky high serum uh, markers. So this is not, not a cutting point. That's why if you look at the uh, Japan guideline, they uh, do not highlight this uh, number. Just it, 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 there's some, uh, one slide they show that is those uh, markers over 2000, either beta CG or ARP, they treat as a long-term marine germ cell tumor. See, yes. the, the key, Godfrey, yes. is in the Western world, we do not have very aggressive neurosurgeons to give us tissue diagnosis. We rely too much on bio, biochemical <laughs> markers. And that's why we keep fighting, you know, what should be the cutoff, which I think is not very productive. So, yes. so I encourage everybody to, to learn the examples from the Japanese and the Chinese neurosurgeons. Then we can have a much better discussion. Uh, you know, <laughs> discussing this cutoff is not going to help. <laughs> but uh, although this, uh, if I cut uh, those uh, less than 100 micro international units and over 100, we have significant uh, survival difference, mm -hmm. lower than 100 uh, or over 100. But for beta CG. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like CG. The treatment, sometimes if you treat less than one, more than 100, as, uh, I mean, long germ germ cell tumor, sometimes may be over treat. Yeah. So, but uh, last question for me, uh, for yeah. Ching. Yeah. Uh, so, for the same finger uh, uh, TA, that, um, so the partner doesn't matter, right? It's because does it matter if it's a well A or yep one? Do they it have any difference? Not, it should not. Well, we show you that we can get rid of REL A completely. Yeah. And we, <laughs> with VP64, it still drives the expression. Yeah. So so the, the supertentorial uh, ependymoma, the classification is a little bit odd because they, it depends on the REL A. Well, that's based on the early population in 2014. I think as we accumulate more and more experience in understanding the underlying biology, that's going to change. Yeah. Okay, I have one question from in the question box. Do you think that any target therapy is coming for Qing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I did not highlight the um, the. Uh, subsequent work following up on those uh, target genes that we found. Uh, unfortunately, I can tell you that many of those very attractive uh, target genes are also found to be expressed in normal tissue. So uh -huh. making it, you know, very precarious to target them directly. Mm. However, we are now taking a slightly different approach uh, which I don't have time to share with you, but maybe next time if you invite me back, I can I can show you the, the <laughs> other story. And that is, we are actually taking advantage of the presence of the fusion itself as an address to deliver the poison to the tumor cells only. Right. Uh, right. This is true genomic medicine approach now. We are mm -hmm. not waiting for the underlying biology to be worked out. Uh, before we uh, develop the therapeutics. So we filed a patent on that already. We have some in vitro data showing that even with uh, uh, ZFTA, uh, REL A uh, positive uh, ependymoma cells, we can kill them without touching the normal cells because mm -hmm. the normal cells don't have the fusion. Right. Uh, if you 
take advantage of the specificity of the fusion itself, you can deliver medicine without uh, harming the normal cells. So that's what we are working on. Maybe next time I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the full story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so how, maybe how... time, uh, yeah, last question yeah. maybe from Alice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no, I was just going to ask, uh, without the fusion, why wouldn't the CF, uh, you know, uh, R95 go into the cell, into the nucleus? Why does it need a fusion to get into the nucleus? Oh, you mean, why not C11 off 95 can do the trick? Right. Yeah, that's why a very good Why does it need question. a fusion? Yeah. yeah. It turns out that uh, C11 of 95 itself is expressed in uh, immature ependymal cells already, but it's not required uh, for the uh, maintenance and development of the uh, uh, primitive ependymal cells into mature ependymal cells. So you know that it's expressed, but it's not, the cells are not critically dependent on it. So I think it's because of that you need the additional transactivating domain that route A contributes or YAP1 contributes in order to drive the uh, effects of C11 off 95 further. That, yeah. that may be the explanation why the fusion works differently from the wild type C11 off 95. Thank you. Okay, I think so time is up. <laughs> yeah, maybe Thank we go to the much. closing remark by uh, Hiroki, our PSYOP Asia president. Yeah. Hey, yeah. good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Hiroki, the continental president of PSYOP Asia. I would like to express my great thanks to your attendance at the second EFAC Global Seminar. At the today's seminar, we could learn a lot about the recent advancement in the pediatric brain tumor, especially in intracranial germ cell tumors and ependymomas through the lectures by three distinguished researchers. We learned a genetic alteration in germ cell tumors and the sprotentorial ependymoma. I would like to say thank, thank you to Joanna uh, Joe, Dr. Tai Tong Wang, and Dr. Jin Lao for your great contribution. It is well known that intracranial germ cell tumor is uh, more common in Asian population. I expect EFAC will plant the in, uh, international collaborative studies focusing on this tumor. We are thinking a better strategy against anaplastic ependymoma. It should be better if we can collaborate for this brain tumor too. This seminar is a good opportunity to share new knowledge on pediatric brain tumor with our colleagues in Asia. I hope this seminar will be useful for the clinical practice and the research activity in Asian region. We close the seminar with appreciation to all attendant speakers, moderators, and organizers. Thank you. See you at the next EFOC seminar. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. We'll no. write to you, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Thank I'll you. be in Hong Kong too, Tai Tong. See if yes, we can. Yes, uh, January. Okay. Yeah, I'll January. try. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye bye.